Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Shabbat shalom. I enjoyed being hosted at the rabbi's house, meeting his lovely wife and his lovely daughter, Rahil. Rahil, it's not racial, by the way, sir. Uh, and uh, I spent a few hours there correcting their Hebrew, which I don't... <laughs> and I don't speak Hebrew. Uh, of course, I retained him one dollar, so he can give me some legal advice. This was the cheapest, best lawyer I've ever hired in my life. He wanted to know where I lived, so I give him a dollar. Now that he's an attorney, I know by law he cannot disclose the information. <laughs> and if he does, I will kill him. <laughs> I hope you brought your Bibles with you, because we do the same as well. If you we don't have your Bibles, the ushers will take you to the back and shoot you. And <laughs> this way we solve this problem the way we do things in my neck of the woods. My name is Walid. I never knew what my name really meant until my mother told me many years later. My mother was an American, and she met my father in Eureka in California. And she decided to visit the Middle East with my father, nine months pregnant with myself. She went to a small little village where my father lived called Beit Lahem. I don't know if you've heard about this village. <laughs> you sing about us once a year and you forget about us for the rest of the year. Beit Lahem. And uh, in fact, I never understood what Beit Lahem, there are two words actually, not one word. It's not Bethlehem, it's two words. And never understood what Beit Lahem meant. I was confused because the Jews keep saying this is the house of bread. And the Arabs say this is the house of meat. Which one is it? Meat or bread? Lahem means meat and Lahem means bread until years later I looked up the Aramaic dictionary and discovered that lahem has two meanings. One means bread, and the other means flesh, meat. It was the house of bread, and it's a house of meat. And I remember the first time when I read the words of the Messiah, in which he said this, he took the bread, and he broke it, and he says, this is my flesh. Do this in remembrance of me. Even the name of the village was prophetic. Everything in the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Kutubim, the Brit Hadashah was prophetic, every word. I was not introduced to this prophetic word. My mother gave birth to myself in the upper room of my grandfather's house with a manger downstairs, well, everything. But no, I, some of you are looking at me funny because they think I'm the one. I'm not the one, okay? <laughs> uh, there is another coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to unloosen. And my mother was informed fairly quickly when she gave birth to myself, welcome to the Middle East, you know, uh, now that your son is Muslim and your kids, other kids, my, my brother and my sister were Muslim, uh, you don't need to use your return ticket. She realized fairly quickly she was entering uh, the Hotel California. You know, you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. And especially the young girls here, don't marry a Muslim. If you think that your rabbi and your parents don't know what they're talking about and that you're in love, you try to marry a Muslim and then he can decide to take you back to his home country, whether it's Libya, Sudan, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, uh, Jordan, whichever Muslim country he wants, you don't have a right to return back to your country. And you'll be thinking about your messianic rabbi for the rest of your life, what he said to you. And you can go to any embassy you want and they cannot help you. And including the American embassy cannot help you. Because there isn't a single Muslim country that is signatory to the Hague Convention regarding the abduction of women and children. So don't be stupid. Talk to my mother before you do that. And she can tell you lots of things, you know. I thought Islam was a peaceful religion. She, she calls it very simply. It's not Islam. It's it's. Slam. You say anything and it's slam. You're dead. That was a very quick interpretation of all Islam, according to my mother. And then, so, uh, I grew up there, of course, and went to Christian school, I remember. I was the only Muslim in a Christian school. I remember walking into the Bible study, but my birth certificate says, Father Muslim, Mother Christian, Child Muslim. 
and walked into the class in the Bible study and I was always thrown out. I was not allowed to study the Bible. And one time uh, was Mrs. Krista. Actually, she was martyred later on. Mrs. Krista was a missionary. And I walked into Mrs. Krista's class, the Bible study, and the bully stood up. He says, what are you doing here? You're supposed to get out. You're not, number one, you're a Muslim. Number two, you're an American. In fact, my nickname in town was the son of the American, if you know what I mean. Instead of S-O-B, I was called S-O-A. And I gave so many bloody noses, eventually they stopped calling me this name. And here in the class, and uh, the bully stood up and she said, you know what? He is the only one amongst all of you who wants to learn the Bible. Sit down. And she broke the record. The Muslim sitting in the class in a Christian school was impossible. And I learned the Bible from Mrs. Christa a little bit, you know, what I can peruse from what she taught. She was a good woman. The year later, I was under Hani Oda, which is a Palestinian teacher. And of course, there we learned that Jesus was a Palestinian revolutionist. Abraham was a Palestinian revolutionist. Moses was a Palestinian revolutionist. All bunch of Palestinian revolutionists in the Bible. Adding more confusion to me than I went to fifth grade to the government school. And there, of course, I was correcting the Muslim teacher and say, you know, I, I don't understand in the Quran, we talk about uh, Moses. Why doesn't the Quran mention Safura? Who's Safura? It's not in the Quran. I says, I, I learned it from the Christian school. What's Safura? Smack, 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 forget Safura, there's no such thing. But I learned some things. The seed was planted in, since I was young. And of course, continued all the way to high school and there in high school, our teachers, Sheikh Naim Ayyad, Sheikh Zakaria, graduates from Al-Azhar University, the number one university par excellence in the Sunni Muslim world. And there where I got my education, it was a salvation plan of some sort. The salvation plan is that when you are killed in jihad, according to the Quran, which says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Do not think that the ones who die in the cause of Allah are dead, but they are alive in Allah's blessings. In other words, the way to assure yourself salvation in Islam is to die as a martyr in jihad. In fact, we learned also Islamic eschatology. I, could, I wish I'd spend an hour teaching you Islamic eschatology so you know how it is the antithesis of biblical eschatology. In Islamic eschatology, of course, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تغلب طائفة من المسلمين طائفة من اليهود قيل أين يا رسول الله قال في بيت المقدس وقال في بيت المقدس. No, I'm not speaking in tongues. <laughs> I'm quoting the verse verbatim from the hadith. The day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations. And then the trees will cry out and the stones will cry out. Oh Muslim, oh servant of Allah, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come, come and decapitate him. Till not one Jew is alive. Of course, taking this salvation plan, we must knock on the gates of heaven with the skulls of Jews. In fact, that slogan is written all over the Middle East. It's the most famous slogan even written in Israel amongst the Palestinian neighborhoods. And of course, life goes on, and I remember going to the Temple Mount, started rioting, angry, never really spoke to a Jew, except behind fire, tire, burning tires and Molotov cocktails and what have you. Eventually, end up in prison, and in prison, I ended up getting involved with a notorious bomb maker by the name of Mahmoud al-Mughrabi. Of course, if you look me up on the internet, the first thing you will find out, Walid Shu'abat is a fraud. And you believe it. Yet you Google Jesus or Yeshua or the Messiah, and you'll also find him to be fraud because he married Mary Magdalene and he was an adulterer, you know. But this is the way it is. Mahmoud al-Mughrabi was a real person. In fact, he was written by Christopher Hitchens. And even the late Edward Said wrote about Mahmoud al-Mughrabi. Eventually, my recruiter was killed in Operation Wooden Leg. All these things can be confirmed, including the names and details. Destroy Yasser Arafat. Finally, he was killed with 
other 30, 40 terrorists. And of course, I, pl I, I planted that bomb after I came out of prison. It exploded. Luckily, I threw it on the roof because I saw children roaming around about the bank. And so the story begins. I was terrified for the first time knowing that I could have blood in my hands. My life went on, came to the States, and in the States, I was in Chicago. I was now recruited into the Muslim Brotherhood because I was disenfranchised with the PLO. And in the Muslim Brotherhood under Sheikh Jamal Saeed, who was the colleague of Abdullah Azzam, who was the godfather of Al-Qaeda in Chicago. And there we were training underground and in basements and what have you. This is 1980-81 on how we can destroy America and destroy Israel and the whole thing. And that later on, the Islamic Association of Palestine there gave birth to what is called the Council of American Islamic Relation, as well as it became the Hamas branch U.S. and began funding monies and funneling monies to Hamas. Later on in my life, I ran into my wife, Maria, and that's what made all the difference. There was actually two women in my life, or three women, I think, Mrs. Krista, my mother, and Maria. My mother planted the second seed before I met Maria. I was 18 years old, and my mom and dad slept in separate rooms, and I never figured out why my mom slept in separate rooms than my father all the time. And I used to steal my mother's uh, menthols at night time, you know, when you're desperate, menthols will do. And apparently she was rededicated into her faith by a missionary from Dallas who went to Israel. He was a pioneer. His name is Edwin Davis from Dallas, Fort Worth. In fact, he just passed away about a month or two ago. Look him up. And he bought her a Bible with an olive wood cover and gave it to her, and she secretly was studying her Bible. She left it under the couch. Oh, a grenade, thank you. <laughs> and this is the suicide pack they gave me, you know. <laughs> he warned me, if I don't finish on time, they will detonate it via cell phone, <laughs> so I better hurry up. And she put her pack cigarettes with the Bible under the couch as she slept. At night time, I would come, sneak in, take the menthol, go to my room, open the window, you know. And of course, these days, especially in America, you know, you go, they say that, you know, don't you know your body is the Holy Spirit, you know. You know, you have the Holy Spirit in your body. You shouldn't be smoking. And I always, of course, respond to that argument. And I say, if my body was the Holy, you know, the temple of the Holy Spirit, did not God say to burn incense in the temple? <laughs> and then in addition, he added, he said, this was a sweet aroma to my nostrils. <laughs> so what's wrong with your American nostrils? So anti-smoking. The Nazis were the first ones to ban smoking. Did you know that? In Israel, everybody smokes. In America, we still have to smoke in secret. But one day I decided to... Uh, steal my mother's cigarettes, and I saw the Bible. Second day, I confronted my mother. I says, Mother, why are you studying the Bible? You are not a Muslim. You're a Christian? And she said, well, yes, I am. I says, well, I'm going to tell my father. She said, go ahead. I will tell him about your smoking habit. <laughs> and so we, uh, I don't know how else to put it, we cracked a deal. <laughs> Never understood why she slept in a separate room. She told me. She says, you know, in Islam, the Quran says, If you fear your wife's disobedience, because my mother was never this Muslim obedient wife. She was American and she had her own mind. Whenever your wives are disobedient, then abandon them in bed. Don't sleep with them in the same bed in order to punish the wife. Because a wife has needs, you know, and eventually she will succumb as a result of her needs. And then he will give her her needs. And then this way, how you have an obedient wife. And my mother used to say, out of all the Islamic punishments I had to endure, that was my favorite punishment. <laughs> I cannot fathom that women need us. We are ugly creatures. They are beautiful. Try to uh, put your hairy legs in the street and see if the trucker stops. Have your wife try it. Ah! Come on, baby, get in a truck, you know. 
And so uh, now the uh, snitch has been silenced because she attempted to escape and she was caught. So now I became the snitch. The kids became the snitches. And I asked my mother, what does this book tell you? That's planted that second seed. What does this book tell you? She said, it tells me everything I need to know. It's sort of like Futurology 101. So what do you mean that tells you everything you need to know? Let me know, mother. Does it tell you if I, as a Palestinian, will have a Palestinian state? Because that's all I want. I want to kill the Jews, and I want to have a Palestinian state. Does it tell me that? She goes, yes, it does. It does. And Zechariah talks about how they will attack Jerusalem and how they'll try to kill the Jews, but God will be angry. And it talks about the land being divided in Joel chapter 3. I will gather all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment there with them on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. So son, the land will be divided, but God will be angered at the division of that land and you will be judged. I said, I don't understand, mother. God is on our side. We are the righteous and the Jews are the bad guys. We're the good guys. How could that be possible? Is it possible that we as the good guys did not know that we were not the good guys, that we were the bad guys? And it could be possible that the bad guys are the good guys, but we didn't know that they were the good guys because we were such a bad guys, couldn't see the good guys. <laughs> How does it make any sense? You know, I said, what do you mean by Futurology 101? She said, well, in Isaiah, it says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me for telling the end from the beginning. So when you see it happen, that you know that I am God. That seed was planted, that God was the God of history and the God of the future. Later on in my life, when I attempted to convert my wife, Marie, a Mexican-American girl, voluptuous, nice looking, and I was in love. And of course, I wanted Maria to become a Muslim wife. I said, Maria, it's time for you to become a good Muslim wife. She says, why, I'm not good enough for you. Oh, you're good enough, but it's time for you to become Muslim. She said, why should I become Muslim? I said, well, you know, the Quran is the purest book in the world. The Bible has been corrupted. In fact, ask any Muslim, why do you reject the Bible? Said, the Bible has been corrupted. It's not the same as it used to be. The Old Testament, it's not that old either, was basically corrupted by the Jews. And the New Testament was corrupted by the Christians. The truth is in the Quran. She said, well, you know, I'll be glad to become a Muslim if you show me those corruptions in the Bible. I said, well, I don't know where the corruptions are in the Bible. She said, how come you don't know where they are? Do you always make claims about a book you never read? Said, For a woman, you're pretty smart. <laughs> and so I purchased the Bible for $10 blue cover, New King James, and I began to put it side by side with the Quran and began to do an analysis, spend a year analyzing between the two books. And I was shocked. By the time I finished my analysis, I discovered truly that I was correct. The Bible has been corrupted. And this is what I'm here to announce to you today. The lawyer, Messianic Rabbi, is very nervous. He's about to throw me out. And the rest of the congregation is about to burn me at the stake. So, but before you do, I know my rights, Mr. Lawyer. I know my rights. I have right to give my last word. Right? Yes. It better be good before they kill me, right? Yes, the Bible has been corrupted. By the time I examined the Quran, I began to realize that the Quran is the corruption of the Bible. They took verses from the Bible, corrupted the text, put it in the Quran, and called that a Bible. So I ended up for the first time beginning to see that the corruptors accuse the innocent of corruption. The projection mentality of evil. If you suspect your wife is cheating, perhaps you're the cheater and you don't trust anyone. If you're dishonest, you don't trust anyone because you think everybody's like you. Begin to see what the Messiah says when he said, be careful, you know, don't accuse others. Look at your own self. I began to unravel things. But I began to unravel a lot more things when I decided one day to pray. 
in the name of the God of Ibrahim, Ishaq and Yaqub. In the name of God, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to show me the truth. And the floodgates of heaven opened up. And I began to read the text like never before. I began to see things I could never see. In fact, you just sang a couple songs. You said, revive us, revive us. And reminded me of the Mexican prophet Jose. <laughs> Jose, the Mexican prophet in chapter six, talked about reviving us. And what did he say? After two days, talks about Israel being stricken. And after two days, he re will revive us, 2,000 years. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. He revives Israel. I was shocked. I came to my memory the six days war that I remember. My mother was there. And the embassy came to rescue her and get her out because she was an American. My father would not allow them. I said, no, that's my wife. These are my kids. You can't take her to the United States. And she was there in the six days war. I never forgot that war. Six days and five hours. Right in the dawn before the sun came up, Israel conquered and defeated all the enemies that surrounded her. And I opened the door. I remember seeing the tanks in Jericho. We were living in Jericho. We moved from Je to Jericho when my father was teaching. And the tanks were moving into the streets with the Star of David, blue Star of David. And I said, Father, this is not our flag that we saluted in the school. You told us you listening to the radio station in Egypt and and Syria and Jordan, they were saying, we've cleansed Jerusalem from all the Jews. And now we see that they're in, the, in Jericho. Well, I must have been tuned in to the wrong wavelength. It's a matter of life and death if you tune in the wrong wavelength sometimes. That little mistake could kill you. And my mother was rejoicing. And my father was asking, why are you rejoicing? It's because I took in Sunday school when I was a young kid. That one day the Jews will come back. They will come back and then the Messiah will come. 2,000 years and they were back. In fact, when I read the text, there was only one nation in the world that had two six days war. No one else. Joshua had a six days war. If you look closely at the texts, Rabbi was saying, I'm very textual, which I am. Very meticulous to the text, and I'll tell you why. If you look at the text, it says, and on the, what, seventh day, on the dawning of the day. It was dawn, still pitch dark. The dawn is dark still. The day has not commenced. They went around the walls of Jericho seven times, blew the shofars, and the state of Israel was established in Joshua's time. I don't need historic revisionism to tell me that that story is true because I saw the truth in my own eyes. Six days war, 1967, and we saw it all. By the time I, I read the book of Jeremiah the prophet, I was shocked to see the day is coming, says the Lord, that no longer will the children of Israel say that God who's brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but God, who's brought the children of Israel out of the land of the north and out of all the lands that he has driven them. Without a Moses. It took hell to bring them out with Moses, one guy, one nation from one country, Egypt, yet they're coming from 100 different countries in our time and without a Moses. And in the West, they always got such so personal that they forgot he loved the whole world. That he focused on the whole world and he focused on the whole Middle East. The biggest problems I had is when I believed and what I believed and what I read and I walked into a church. That's when the trouble began. That's when everything began. That's when I became a fraud and a, a, somebody who does not understand the Bible. And I simply read the word. I go, excuse me, you, you know. When the Messiah came the first time, everybody expected him to come riding on a white horse. And they expected him to defeat the Romans. And when he came, in accordance to the text, riding on a jackass, a donkey, and he came to hang on a tree, they rejected him. 
So, well, you know, eschatology doesn't matter. This eschatological stuff, Wally, you're talking about doesn't matter to us. It's all about the main doctrines, you know? Yes. Um, imagine if I was John the Baptist and we were waiting for the Messiah and I was giving a lecture at a synagogue. I say, prepare the way. I'm in sackcloth. He's coming. And I say, he comes on a donkey. You stone me. But the first coming, a donkey versus a horse made such a huge difference. Would you not think that those textual things in the Bible and those stories in the Bible about his second coming will make more difference? Because you also sang the song, Behold, he comes riding on the clouds. And I just want to make sure if the Messiah comes riding on a cloud, have the correct answer you will be shot <laughs> where is he going wrong he's not going to Jerusalem he's not going to the Mount of Olives that's a different story anybody else what happened to raising your hands and order where is he going Wrong. He's not going to the Jezreel Valley riding on the clouds. You give up. You all get shot. <laughs> the Lord comes riding on a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. Isaiah 19 verse 1. The Messiah is coming to Egypt. The Messiah is coming to rescue the remnants in Egypt. That you forgot the Copts. And they will cry for the Messiah right there in the text. And God will send them who? A savior and a mighty one. Read the text. Who is this mighty one? Does it not say in the psalm? Gird your sword on your thigh. O mighty one. And what about Egypt. That neighborhood will fight against neighborhood in Isaiah 19. City against city. Have you not been watching Port Said going against Cairo with a massacre over a soccer game? And the analysts cannot understand what is going on in Egypt because they do not understand there is no political motivation for these massacres. Do you not see in the text that God says in Isaiah 19, he will give the Egyptians to a perverse spirit in which they will be sort of demonic. Those things are happening in front of your very eyes. But you don't pay attention to the text. Because what you pay attention to is tradition of men. I was shocked. When I studied scripture, I was shocked. Even one congregation here gave a verse. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. I remember reading the book of Isaiah in chapter 63. Just one verse. Just one verse, two verses. What does Isaiah 63 talk about? Who is this who comes from Edom with his garments dyed in blood? He doesn't come out of Rome. He comes out of Edom. And where is Edom? When I read in Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 13, God says, And I will stretch out my arm against Edom and make it desolate from Teman and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. Who is the arm of the Lord? How does God stretch out his arm? Does not Isaiah the prophet write in the first verse? He says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who is the arm of the Lord then? Is not that the Messiah? The Messiah is God's right arm. He, he will send to Edom and destroy it from Timan, Yemen. And they of Dedan, Saudi Arabia, will be destroyed. How many existence in the Bible 
talks about Saudi Arabia a lot, but you don't read them. When was the last time you had a, I don't know, I'm in Texas, right? There's a bunch of rednecks in Texas. <laughs> when was the last time you had a redneck Sunday school teacher who begins the class with, uh, let's see, oh, well, today we'll be discussing how the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to fight the Muslims in Egypt. <laughs> Never happened in your history. And I was in Dallas, Texas, when God appointed me to speak to the scholars. I asked them two Jesus-style questions. You know what a Jesus-style question is? It's the kind of question when you ask it, the one who's going to respond has two choices. Confess he was a fool or look like a fool. I asked them the question. I said, out of every single piece of text in the scriptures, can you find me a single verse in which God judges a nation in end times that is not Muslim today. You didn't really dig seriousness of the question, did you? Out of all the texts in the Bible, can you show me a single verse in which a nation God judges that is not Muslim? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about the Chinese in the Bible. Last I've heard of the kings coming out of the east, they came to my village in Bethlehem to worship the king. And they came from the east of the Euphrates. If you go to the east of the Euphrates, you know, China is but one king. It's talking about several kings. You go east of the Euphrates, you find Iraq. You go east, I know you're lousy in geography, but that's Iraq. Then you find what? Iran. Then you find Afghanistan, Pakistan, Indonesia. I can get you 200 million man army, no problem. Well, it's got to be China because they're the only ones that can provide 200 million man army. Where does it say China in the text? It doesn't say that. Ezekiel 38. Why is not Ezekiel 38 interpreted by Ezekiel 30 in which it mentions Libya in both places? And there in Ezekiel 30, it tells you what's intended from Megog, Meshach, and Tubal, and Beit Togarma. It tells you the country is Lydia. Ezekiel 38 tells you it's Lydia. Kush, Sudan. Egypt is involved as well. Why do you only study Ezekiel 38 by itself? And find me a Bible dictionary or Bible map. Look up all the Bible maps you want. You can look up the <clears throat> Macmillan Bible Atlas, the Moody Bible Atlas, the Encyclopedia of Bible Lands, the Oxford Bible Atlas, the old show, Meshach Tubal, Beit Tugarma, Magog. All that region is in Asia Minor and the southern parts of Russia. Not Russia proper. If you go to southern Russia today, you'll find Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and even the Messiah himself. He talked about the country. He says, you know, Pergamus, thou art the seat of Satan. Where is Pergamus? Of course, you're lousy in geography, you don't know. But if that is the seat of Satan, is that not the seat of the Antichrist? Boy, if I have a week with you just to study the Antichrist, does not first John chapter 2 verse 22 say, who is the liar? It is but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. It is he, the Antichrist, that denies the Father and the Son. Antichrist cannot be a Jew and he cannot be a Catholic. Like I was telling the lawyer yesterday, I says, you know, Sean Hannity cannot be the Antichrist. He can be a Jew, and he's not even homosexual. It does not say he does not desire women. He says, it says in Daniel chapter 11, he does not honor the desire of women. He does not care about women because he is like his father, the father of lies in Genesis, in which in Genesis, God says, I will put enmity between you, the devil, and the woman. You will hate the woman. That solves all your marital problems, gentlemen. If you hate your wife, you're on the side of the devil. You hate Israel, you're also on the side of the devil. In Daniel chapter 11, the Antichrist divides the land for gain. In Joel 3, the Messiah gets ticked off at all these nations that divided up his land and he judges these nations. You are pro-Palestine and the Antichrist is pro-Palestine. You say you're a Christian 
and you go and judgment under Christ because he divided the land, you're a pro-Palestine. Now, when he comes and judges, which side are you on? And how do you think he's going to judge you? Uh, Jesus, forgive me. I was pro-Palestine. I didn't mean to really. But you look at all these guys that are pro-Palestine. They're also pro-homosexual pastors, pro-lesbians and gays. If you go to these demonstrations that are anti-Israel, which I used to be, who did we hold hands with? Gays, lesbians, liberals, anarchists, socialists, communists. And I always used to ask myself, why is it that I am amongst these multitudes and those Bible-thumping Christians refuse to hold hands with these guys? What makes them so different? It was shocking to me to learn that God did not even care about the Arabic language. You have to go to heaven, you have to pray in the Arabic language. That God translated his word to hundreds and thousands of languages. Why was their God, our God only knew one language and their God was multilingual? Was he Harvard graduate? <laughs> what is wrong with these languages? Why one language? Because it, right there, you dummy, you wally, you, you stupid. It says it right there, the story of the Tower of Babel. God made the languages, the tongues on purpose so he can protect nations from other nations. So he raised America. So he can, so America can basically baseball bat Germany when it goes out of line. And bring Saddam Hussein to judgment, to trial. And bomb the hell out of these rapists who rape. America has a purpose. And no, America is not destroyed in the end times. And this is something that's so ridiculous. Oh, America's gone. I sat next to this lady on a plane and she got John Hagee's book, Will America Survive? I wanted to crack a conversation with this lady. She's a believer and I'm a believer. We have a nice two hour conversation. I said, so what do you think, ma'am? Will America survive? She goes, no, I won't. I said, why not? It's because the book says so. John said so. I says, which John? John Hagee or John the Revelator? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I haven't read the book. Which book? John Hagee's or John the Revelator? <laughs> she did not like me at all. I says, here I am supposed to get along with my fellow brother. and They don't want to get along with me. Why? Where does it say in the Bible that God's going to destroy America? Well, America does not mention it in the Bible. That's why God's going to destroy it. Papua New Guinea is not mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> Sorry, Mexicans, you're dead. <laughs> Canadians, you're minced meat. You're gone. You're not in the Bible. Frenchmen, all you people, dead, finished, everybody. Eskimos are gone. <laughs> I mean, well, it's, it's, it's right there in Zechariah, you know. It's, all the nations will come against Jerusalem. Oh, you think the Antichrist is going to be right there in the Mount of Olives. And he's going to say, Papua New Guineans, attack. Eskimos, go forth. <laughs> it doesn't say all the nations because you've got to look at the text. And it says, as of all the nations that came against Jerusalem. Not all the nations. When it says all the nations, it doesn't mean every nation on earth. Because even you look at Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. When he wrote a decree, had a decree sent out to every nation, tribe, and tongue on the face of the earth. Everybody should worship. Worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Was that letter sent out to every nation? Was it sent to the Mayans, to the Chinese, to the Indians? Solomon, his wisdom went through the whole earth. Did it go to Africa, everywhere in the world? Get serious. This is the expression in Hebrew. This is the Middle East expression. My father got stung with a scorpion, so I went in the roof and I cried to the whole world. It means I was so loud. Like I am now. So... The amazing thing, then when I became a believer, it was all these stupid things, you know. There's something called all oh, millennialist. I mean, what, what's all oh, millennialist? I began to look into all oh, millennialist. What is somebody going to the bathroom? And oh, you know, what is it? All oh, millennialist. All oh, millennialist. They believe everything in the Bible was fulfilled. It's sort of like Jesus is going to just pop. And that's it. That's all the things left. I says, well, I can give you one half of a verse. That could throw the all millennialists in disarray. And here's the verse. Half a verse. 
when I read Amos as a Muslim, I began to recognize the amazement about this book. In Amos chapter 9, verse 15, God says, And I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled out of that land. It's impossible to uproot Israel. So if this book was a book in history, like the Amalinialist says, all been fulfilled, either the Bible now has a mistake because they were pulled out of that land by the Romans. When were they ever not pulled out of that land? This only could apply to our time today. It's impossible to dismiss that one half of one verse to say the amillennialists are right. I am sorry, but Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man, turned me off. I turned the radio off as soon as it became Hank Hanegraaff. I said, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's Israel. He's against Israel. Turn it off. That's it. Done. And a story. My friend Kamal Salim, a terrorist who also read the Bible, who also became a believer, began to speak. And there he was invited and Hank Hanegraaff was there. And Hank Hanegraaff told my friend Kamal, Kamal, let me straighten you out about Israel. Here is a book, Apocalypse, whatever. Read it. It will straighten you out. Kamal took that book and he says, Walid, I tossed it to the wastebasket in front of him and it was bullseye, right? Like a basketball player. <laughs> and he says, Mr. Hanegraaff, that's where your book belongs. You will never make me hate Israel. Every single terrorist that I know who ended up loving Israel was from this book. Don't tell me the text doesn't count. It's very meticulous. In fact, I read it in such a way that it does not happen in the West. When I read Isaiah chapter 63, and I was sharing this with you, of the Messiah who comes out of Edom with his garments sprinkled with blood. And there in verse 3, he says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the people no one was with me. If you want to understand how the Messiah treads the winepress in Revelation, it's right there. Why do you start looking at prophecy at the end of the book? Why don't you start at the beginning of the book? Get to the middle of the book. And then you get all these texts that is literal. And then you take all the literal model that you built. And then you superimpose it on Revelation. And you will get the picture. And the picture is very clear. If in Revelation he talks about the body of a leopard. That's the beast, the Antichrist system. Grecian, not Roman even. Feet of a bear, Middle Persian, Iran, mouth of a lion, Babylonian. In fact, did you know that you will never find in the text of the Bible, if you read about Babylon in the Bible, end times Babylon, you know, where was Babylon anyway? Iraq. What was the names of the cities in that ancient Babylon? Babel, Sumer, Akkad, Kelne, Erech. Do you know you'll never find these cities in Babylon in the Bible? In the future Babylon. Did you know in the destruction of the Babylon in the Bible, in every verse where it talks about the vicinities and the cities and the villages where this Babylon is, every single existence in the Bible, those vicinities and those cities and those regions are in Arabia and not in Iraq. Because Arabia was also part of Babylon. And the Bible is so meticulous, God wanted you to know and focus, what does he mean by this Babylon? And where does the Muslims bow to anyway? Is it not Arabia? Is it not Arabia that gushes forth this harlot's oil that your president in this country says America is addicted to oil? Does it not drink the blood of the saints from that filthy religion that killed the martyrs, that is still killing the martyrs everywhere in the world? Is it not the source of this hatred against our believing brothers that the Bible says, and I saw the martyrs that were beheaded in the name of Jesus? Is it not John the Baptist that faced Herod the Great and his head was cut off as a result? Was he not symbolic of the believers of this time? And Herod the Great was symbolic of the Antichrist who does behead people? If you stand in the street corner and you cry as loud as your lung can scream. The harlot is the Catholics. The harlot is Rome. And the system of the beast is the European Union. Does somebody come and cut your head off? 
But if you stand in the street and you say Islam is the religion and the system of Antichrist and Saudi Arabia is a harlot from the pit of hell, where do you dare say what, what, what I'm saying? You'll be terrified. Spirit of Antichrist is the kind of spirit that if you expose it and you speak against it, they will kill you. And I'm accused of being the fraud. I'm accused of being the liar. But everything in the Bible is fulfilled, including every word of the Messiah is prophetic. When he says, blessed are you when they persecute you. Blessed are you when they say all kinds of calumny against you for my name's sake. I watched the Jesus movie, did not know what the English word calumny meant. And until I got, until I got slandered by CNN. And I'm sitting with my wife watching Anderson Cooper 360, the biggest show on CNN, for days upon days slandering me. I says, what is this? Why are they attacking me? Some small Joe Schmo who just read the Bible and is selling Bible books, Christian books at some event for Homeland Security. What's the big deal? Is this country a country that we cannot share our views? This is the freedom of this country. We talk about what we believe. And I told Maria, I said, Maria, I don't understand. I'm playing with the big boys now and all this hell is coming upon me. I said, who do you think you are? I said, now insults from you too, Maria. <laughs> she said, no, that's not what I mean. She said, who do you think you are? If they called the Messiah himself a fraud, do you not have that honor of being called a fraud yourself? For a woman, you're very smart. <laughs> Blessed are you when they persecute you. Blessed are you when they say all kinds of calumny against you for my namesake. Blessed are you when they say all kinds of slander. Calumny means slander, defamation. The first part of the promise of persecution is defamatory accusations against you because of him. That's the first type of persecution you get. Everything is prophetic. The moment I got my phone call from my family, you either come to Bethlehem court, give up your faith, declare the shaharatan and come back to Islam, or your land is gone. I ran to the... You lose mother, father, all these things, and land for my namesake. I said, praise Jesus. I take the loss of my property for a blessing. And this half a verse after half a verse gave me all these blessings, even in 63. There he says in verse 8 and 9, the most amazing verses. If you spend your lifetime to interpret one half of a verse, look what it says in verse 8. For he said, surely they are my people. He's talking about the Jews, children who will not lie. So he, God, became their savior. I began to ask myself, how did God become Israel's savior? It tells you the interpretation in the second verse. In verse 9, it says, in all their affliction, he, God, was afflicted. How was God afflicted? The same way the Jews were afflicted. What does Matthew 25 mean when he says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. Are you telling me that God himself will choose to be afflicted the same way the Jews are afflicted? Yes, it does. How were the Jews afflicted? Were they not naked? Did you not see Auschwitz? Were they not silent in front of their accusers? You show me a footage where the Jews make a peep when they're taken to the slaughter like the lamb. Silent. In silence, they died by the millions. Nude as he was nude. Hungry as he was hungry, starving. In prison as he was in prison. And it happens in front of us when we see it in the Holocaust. First TV set my father bought. Plugged it in, was all week Yom Hashua. For some reason, the Almighty has a sense of humor. <laughs> Walid, you take that story about the Jews too far. 
You compare the Jews with God over here? Yes. He honored them so much that he chose to die as they died. And to suffer as they suffered and to be in the nude. Any man wants to be in the nude and hang on a tree? You go too far. The Messiah rose on the third day. Are you saying the Jews will rise on the third day? Absolutely yes. Read the Mexican prophet Jose. <laughs> on the third day he will revive us. So we may live in his presence 2,000 years. That's it. 2,000 years. We're living this time. And we see God's word in action in a way like never before. And I make declarations in the media way before they happen. It's not because I'm a genius. It's because I stole it from Jews. They had no copyright in the book. <laughs> and I snapped it in a book. And that's what makes you read it. America is in the Bible. It's there. The Antichrist in Daniel chapter 11. He declares war against the strongest fortresses. If he declares war against the strongest of all fortresses, does that mean the Antichrist's kingdom is the strongest fortress of all? Daniel the prophet says, no. But you must conclude, of course, he must destroy the strongest fortress. Well, why don't you read the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 28. God will raise nations from the ends of the earth. The most terrible in battle. The most powerful nations in battle, God will raise against the Antichrist in Ezekiel 28. Very clear because he's the prince of Tyre. And those nations will defeat the Antichrist. That, my friends, is not a message of weakness. It's a message of strength. That God determined nations. And he ordained nations for a purpose. And there is a purpose for America. And if God was nationalistic, by God, I am as well nationalistic. And I will love America. And I will fight for America. And I will fight for Israel. And for a change, I began to love this country because of this. And I repented because of this. And I loved my wife because of this. And I stopped cheating and lying all these things because of this. I began to believe in absolutes because of this. So it is important to pay attention to this because this is the code that God gave us so we can understand his will. The Messiah himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Obeying his commandments is in this. God bless and thank you very much.